Hello there, uh, my name is Ivan, but I'm more known as Provot of Jetlag Demo Group. Uh, this is a slightly updated re-recorded uh, re version of a presentation I gave last week for New England uh, Synth Fest, uh, which was an absolutely delightful event, absolutely recommend it if you are in the area. Unfortunately, the video that I tried to, to, to take uh, at the event uh, got extremely unfocused to the point of being unusable and uh, I also got rather neuro, neuro, nervous and said the word like like 197 times I counted. So I have to re-record the, the talk. Uh, you can count how many likes and us uh, this one will have. Uh, and yes, this talk is about tiny music, it's not as much uh, about technical details, uh, instead it is a brief and wide overview of several ways to make music on a computer in as, in as few bytes as possible. There will be lots of arbitrary example videos, some may contain flashing sequences, so be aware if that's not your kind of things. The slides contain links to examples and the link to the slides can be found in the description down below and you can see it also on screen. Uh, I will only show you short excerpts of from various prods, um, not only for time limit reasons, but also for the reason that most of the things that I'm going to show you are really cool and you should uh, watch them from start to end. I highly recommend watching them in their entirety. Now, let's get started. So, how do you make music on a computer? Uh, certainly the com computers have many loud mechanical parts that we can use. For example, floppy drives, uh, 512 of them, uh, maybe even a bunch of um, scanners too. Or maybe you don't even need a computer. This um, music and video is being generated live entirely on a floppy drive that has been disconnected from a parent computer. Okay, that was obviously a joke. Uh, and it was also running on kind of full hardware, like what are the floppy drives? Uh, so we probably can use something more modern, right? For example, GPUs and coil wine that they make. So a certain compute load profile will make GPU consume power in spikes many thousand times per second, uh, pro producing wine in power, power circuits. Controlling the load, you can make these spikes a desired frequency, thus making sound, notes, stuff like that. Okay, finally, that was also obviously a joke, and for real this time, no, no jokes, no jokes. Uh, there are dedicated sound chips and sound cards. Uh, sending the right data to these will make them produce desired sound. They have been around for quite a while, and people have found various kinds of creative uses for them. For this specific presentation, I will focus on the smallest possible programs uh, producing music on these devices, uh, specifically made in demo scene subculture context. Just know that there are definitely more creative uses in various communities uh, than I'm going to talk about today. So let's start uh, eight slides later with first generations of home computers back in the early 80s. These had only rudimentary audio capabilities, at best they could make a few simple waveforms, an envelope and maybe some basic effects, uh, as this example of a popular seed chip. Uh, some chips didn't even have that and were simple beepers. But, but, even these chips has really uh, simple capabilities, driving them were, was also fairly simple and just a few register writes in a few instructions and you got yourself some kind of a sound. So let's see what can be made with this. Uh, this is an example of 4 kilobytes intro for ZX Spectrum plus AY chip. 
uh, this chip is a bit less capable than SEED, but is somewhat functionally similar for our purposes. Uh, this entire executable file producing this music and video is less than 4096 bytes in size. Okay, so as you can see, it goes for like 8 minutes and there is a lot of content and a couple of significant plot twists, which I won't show you and spoil here. I highly recommend you to watch it completely from start to finish instead. Um, let's move to the next one. The next one is uh, also 8 minutes, but now it's just 1 kilobyte. And this is uh, not an intro, it's so-called music, uh, music disc, which is essentially a music album. Uh, there are four different tracks, and everything, as I said, is just one kilobyte. <laughs> Okay, so the next logical step, uh, not necessarily historically or technically correct, uh, would be to have chips that instead of playing simple fixed waveforms uh, have a built-in wavetables or some or wavetables available as an extension card. Uh, this is what many MIDI sound cards were capable of. They contain tables of dozens of samples of real instruments uh, that you could play. Uh, they sounded kind of lame, falling into an uncanny valley of trying to sound real while not really reaching there, but they are extremely cheap to drive too. There are just three bytes per note, essentially note number, velocity or volume, and channel or instrument number. Uh, these note tables are very compact uh, on their own, uh, but you can also come up with some kind of a scheme to procedurally generate them, and a program doing so can be just a few dozen bytes. So let's move to an example. Uh, this is an example of a full MIDI track with different instruments, a percussion line, and track development. Everything is just in 256 bytes, and there is also visuals synchronized to music too. There are different ways that you could distribute your bytes and you can, for example, make melody simpler, take just, take just one instrument and make a short melodic loop and pour more bytes into visuals. This is the next example, so it's also 256 bytes, also for MS-DOS. Visuals are super cool though, they, they, it would be cool to give an entire talk about <laughs> visuals of this thing, which I won't do, no. Um, the next logical step after MIDI is to completely forego built-in samples and use some custom samples. By late 80s, comput home computers finally became ca uh, performant and capable enough to process almost arbitrary PCM sound. Uh, specifically, Amiga computer had dedicated Polar chip that could play two or four PCM samples in parallel, stretching and squeezing and modulating them um, somehow. 
uh, people quickly realized a convenient way to present uh, these capabilities and to drive this chip. So you had a table of samples and then a sequencer table of nodes to play these samples with. And that could be together packed uh, into a tracker mod file. And this is, a, and there was a certain kind of interface to that, and this is how trackers were born. And the idea was so good that this approach took seen kind of by the st storm. And just a couple of years later, uh, trackers, uh, there were many tracker trackers on every platform everywhere. And uh, the tracker music was kind of the majority of computer music for almost a decade until later in late 90s internet and computer speeds allowed uh, for MP3s to be um, compressed music like MP3s to be uh, popular because like. Decompressing MP3 is kind of computationally hard. It became real time only like by mid 90s on typical home PCs, taking like 100% of CPU time. And the runtime for tracker music is also fairly small. So tracker music was used a lot in 64 uh, kilobyte intros back in the day. Uh, I've seen even uh, tracker music used even in 4 kilobytes intros too. So let's look at how uh, tracker music looks and sound like. Uh, this is just arbitrary tracker music example. It's from 1995, 12 kilobytes. Uh, the entire file is 12 kilobytes. There are four channels, a few samples. I don't remember how many. And this is how it looks, uh, looks like and sounds like. So you see like every table, every column here is a channel and every uh, row is a note or absence of note. You can see that this data is also super compact. It's comparable to media, just a few bytes per note. Also, obviously, as I said, for eight, four kilobyte intros, there exist um, tracker music files that less than 12 kilobytes. You can use, you can be fine just with a single uh, sample. I've seen tracker music with just a single sample of half of a uh, sign uh, that used crazy effects with that to get a lot of music. Unfortunately, I lost this file, so I can't show you. <laughs> the next example is a tracker music from a later date, also 12, 12 kilobytes. Now it's eight channels. And this is essentially tracker music in wild nature. This is how tracker interface look like generic tracker interface. It's a form fast tracker too, which was really popular way to make music in 90s. I used this program a lot. And yeah. This is just typical tracker interface. Some programs still have these kind of tables, renoise, uh, maybe others to uh, mod open MPT, stuff like that. People still make music in those. Anyway, the next step. Uh, up until now, we were limited to pre-recorded samples, uh, but what if we could generate sound ourselves? Do um, what if we could um, could not use any samples, pre-recorded samples at all. For regular uh, PC, CD quality music, we need to produce 44,016 bit numbers per second or twice as much for stereo sound. Uh, so essentially, we just need to write a function that generates these numbers based on current time, sample number of previous, previous sample state or something like that. So how would su such a func function look like? Uh, ByteBeat Byte beat is a relatively new and surprising way to make interesting sounds on a computer. As an example of, way to uh, of ways to produce, this mu uh, produce uh, music 
computationally. So instead of thinking about nodes, uh, sequences, signals, frequencies, and any semblance of music theory, uh, we just take current sample number as an integer and make a few arbitrary looking uh, arithmetic and bitwise operation on this number and use the resulting number as a sample value. Mostly we will get weird uh, noise-like sound, but sometimes some combination combinations lead to very rich and melodic sounds. And they're on, usually they're only uh, a handful or a few dozen of these operations, so it's super cheap computationally and size-wise. It can be run on very old computers, it can run on microcontrollers, it's super, super cheap. The downside of this approach is that there is no comprehensive theory published about it. As far as I know, there are some bits and pieces there, but there is nothing that allows you to build a sound, desired sounds and melodies deliberately. Uh, basically, you have to experiment a lot and train your intuition and maybe then you are able to build something. So let's look at, let's hear what it sounds like. And yeah, it looks like. So this is an example. That this is the entire expression that we, that makes this sound. As you can see, there are only a few multiplication, a few couple of shifts, and a few uh, bitwise operations and and fours. And the sound is fairly rich. There is a melody. There is development. It loops, but it still sounds cool. Kind of cool. The next example. Not that much more, uh, not, not much ma uh, many more operations than the previous example. And the next example, I have a couple. This is fairly long, but it's also kind of cool. So as you can see, these are indeed fairly small and concise, and uh, expression like these are truly convertible to a very small sequence to native sequence of native instructions. For example, x86 assembly. So here's an example of 64 bytes intro. The entire executable is just 64 bytes. It's less characters than this entire slide essentially uh, that does byte beat music and also some visuals. It's a bit gl into a glitch art territory but just look at this. Okay, if you find this technique interesting, there are also a couple of links. One of them is various uh, publications about this technique, and another one, a huge, huge collection of byte beat music that people have made throughout years. Uh, these links are also will be down below. So byte beat is, is not the only way, obviously, to uh, make music. Uh, you can so still build a real software synthesizer, and that would be not that hard to make from, from scratch. So for example, let's make a sine wave. To build a sine wave, you take your current time in seconds, multiply it by frequency, then, and then multiply it by uh, two times, uh, by two pi. 
uh, and as sine has a period of 2 pi, you get frequency number of cycles per second for the sine. So you get a sine wave of the desired frequency. If we uh, then if we um, take time in seconds like this and also multiply it by frequency, but instead of taking sine, we take a fractional part of the resulting number. We get a function that goes from zero to one uh, frequency times per second. So it has this frequency. Uh, it's this will be essentially a sawtooth wave with with the specified frequency. And building, uh, building triangle wave, square wave, uh, making envelopes and other simple waveforms and building blocks is also kind of easy and straightforward. And you can use tools like Graftoy to test various functions to build, build various uh, waveforms. Uh, Stuff like filters and more involved effects. Um, it's this stuff is kind of uh, more involved with more theory, with more signal processing, but it's still fairly approachable. And there are lots of documents and examples on the internet. So to illustrate my point that this is fairly doable, let's do some. Let's build a small, uh, tiny tiny and simple software synthesizer from nothing and i will do it live so we have a function that, that takes current time in t and returns signal uh, sample value signal so as we were saying let's make from um, let's make a sine wave so we got take uh, make sine function multiply it by t multiply let's uh, let's do for 440 hertz and then multiply by 2 pi so it's uh, 6 um, uh, like that right this is does it look like pi okay so this looks like a sine wave and sounds like a sine wave so it's, it's probably sine wave um, it does sound like constant sine wave probably you can't even hear me be behind the sine wave so let's uh, multiply it by something smaller so it's not as loud and then what we'll do we'll we can also add an exponential decay uh, which is minus 3 by, by t uh, and that will make it point only only once then we can yeah yeah let's animate that then what we can do we can uh, make a fractional part of t which make will make it repeat every second so every time t reaches one it starts back from uh, zero uh, what we can do then we can compute um, other waveforms so let's build p which is a fractional part uh, t multiplied by frequency uh, let's do the frequency float frequency let's do the same for 40 um, also replace it here. so the, this is essentially our phase for the desired frequency uh, so we can replace it here and we'll essentially get no changes but these are the simple building blocks and next we can take uh, we can take and uh, make some different um, uh, let's make a sawtooth the sawtooth will be just this p value uh, why did it do that i don't know so this is sawtooth uh it's kind of weird i think it needs to be like that to yeah for, to go from zero to one uh to have more uh range uh we can also build a square wave for example if p is more than a half then we do one otherwise we do zero uh, yeah we have a yeah minus one and one yeah we, we should do that instead so it's full range Okay, and we can also build a triangle wave. It's a bit more involved, so I will just copy and copy paste it from this part of the thing. Where was that? Yeah, this one. It's fairly doable, I just don't want to type everything from scratch. Uh, so this is a triangle wave. 
cool. So this is the basic building blocks with different uh, type of uh, waveforms. What we can do next is start playing different frequencies. So let's make a function that I will call M2F um, that will take note number and return the frequency. And for that, let's do a base frequency of 11 Hz and multiply it by this weird thing, which is um, this n divided by 12. The point in this, uh, my English skills are lacking to describe it, but essentially it's such a way that every 12, every, every uh, increase of n of 12, 12 makes it two times larger because for regular western music an octave is 12 uh, notes spaced mm, uh, linear and not linearly how do you put it anyway like this makes it uh, makes it with a western type of music with note numbers similar to that of midi so now we can uh, do this and let's make note 54 for example and uh, does it work oh yeah we completely forgot to yeah yeah and uh, yeah we can now control we can do the next note it's 12 semitones okay So yeah, now we have a way to specify a note using this thing. So what we can do next is to pick, uh, to make a simple sequencer, which will be, uh, so let's do, let's make a variable pause, which is a floor, uh, just an integer of T. Uh, we should probably do it here before we take a fractional part of T. Uh, t divided by um, floor of T, floor of T, yeah, and modulo, modulo 4, so we have a sequence of that this number, so this goes up 1 every second, and this one goes from 0 to 3 and then wraps around, so then we can do uh, float n, which is our node, let's do 54 for example, um, and then if pose equals uh, 1, we'll do n equals uh, 56, and then we, when pose equal 2, we'll get to 50, mm, 59, and then we, when it equals 3, we'll get to 61. And then pass this end to here. I think we need to speed these things up. So let's do it like that. Uh, and uh, probably divided by 4. No, not, not as fast, not as fast. Let's do it like this. Okay, good enough. So what are these numbers? It's essentially a subset of pentatonic scale and pent pentatonic scale has this really cool feature that any note in any sequence would sound just okay. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it like that, for example, and um, the next thing that we can try to do here is we can do a delay effect. So let's do a function voice that takes t, copy all of this, uh, not all of this, copy all of this to function voice. Um, yeah, let's maybe do float s equal zero here, and then return return s, and then we can do s equal voice t, and then we can start adding 
um, the same voice with uh, being slightly backwards in time. Oh, it should be half. No, no, it should be half. And maybe do like that. And maybe do like that. One. And maybe, maybe even third layer. It's barely hearable. And another trick here would be to uh, add the same voice, but maybe with slightly lower, slightly slower. So S plus equals 0.5 multiplied by voice T 0.5 multiplied by 0.5. Okay, that was a really small example of music, so you can we build just a function for making uh, frequencies out of notes, we made a small sequencer, we made a few uh, waveforms, and we make made, made delay effect and added a couple of voices. So, <clears throat> with these simple primitives you can build a small soft scenes, convert that to x86 assembly and make it super compact, compact. This is an example of 256 bytes uh, intro for MS-DOS that contains a soft th scenes of these kind of primitives and there are three instruments, there is a sequencer and there are also visuals. Stuff that we can hear uh, here is essentially the same set of building blocks that I showed you just now. And as you might have noticed, the live demo that I did right now was done in shader toy using GLSL language. GLSL is a shader language uh, which was designed to compute uh, pixel colors. Uh, for video games and other vi visualizations, uh, but as everything in computers, pixels are just bytes and numbers and they can be reinterpreted as something else. So in this case we used GLSL to produce and write pixels into an off-screen area and then interpret the, these bytes as sound. And uh, just to give you an idea, depending on pixel format, a full HD image uh, might contain enough bytes to have a um, minute to three minutes worth of audio. 
Uh, so we use this cool method of generating music on GPU, a thing that was not supposed to be generate any music at all. What can GPUs do? Uh, there are a few caveats with this method though. Uh, while sound is a time series thing, pixel um, by the nature of GPU architectures, uh, pixels are produced all at once in parallel. So ne neighbor pixels uh, can't know anything about each other and thus we can't uh, produce, we can't have any effects that are based on knowing history of, of the sound we can't read signal previous signal values. This is why in the live demo we faked delay with calling the same voice multiple times with different, uh, with different T slightly in the past. A bit usual uh, delay effect would be based on a buffer where we store current sample and read some, uh, some time back in, 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 into, the, in, into the past. The second um, limitation is that 32-bit floating point number is not great for storing time with enough precision, so about after 30 seconds or so there are audible artifacts uh, just based on floating point precision. And on Shader Toy, which is the website we used here, there's specifically a limitation of 60, second, 60 seconds of music. Uh, let's hear some more GLSL music examples. This is a fairly involved shader with quite a few instruments and quite a few sequences and a few other effects, which I won't show you here. And you can also, instead of building some instruments, you can also emulate an old school AY chip on a modern GPU in GLSL. And as GLSL is just a language that is just used to just compute just numbers, uh, you can also use it to compute byte bit too. So this is a four kilobyte intro for a mod modern mm, PC running Windows. It uses GLSL to do both byte bit and regular sof soft thing combined in GLSL, yeah. <laughs> It also computes visuals uh, in GLSL. So everything here is GLSL running on sh uh, shaders on GPU. This is also super cool. I recommend you watch it from start to finish. Now, you might say that this is cool and all, but making music like this does require well-developed programming skills. How do you start making small music if you are not a programmer? Turns out there are pre-made small synthesizers made for producers who know next to nothing about programming. These are often distributed as VST plugins usable with any DAW, although there are some which are fully standalone programs with their own bespoke sequencers. Uh, these small soft scenes are usually, usually made with a specific size category in mind. Uh, there are well-established 4 kilobyte and 64 kilobyte intro categories in the demo scene. For 4 kilobytes, 4clan is the most popular one. I'd say that 90% of all 4K intros released in the past 10 plus years have been made using 4clan, but don't quote me on that, I haven't counted, it's just my impression. There is also more modern Sointu, which is a fork of four clan with a few different features and arguably a friendlier interface. There is also much more, more older and simpler Sonant and relatively modern Oidos. We, and Oidos is notorious for very long pre-calc times, say waiting for a couple of minutes in a complete silence before it starts playing 
anything. And there are many, many others. For 64 kilobytes, uh, there is 20 year old V2, which was popular back in the day. There's rather popular 64 clan that's about 10 years old, uh, although it's been uh, devel in development since and it has been open sourced as 2017, I think. And there's more modern Wave Saber. Now, let's look at 4Clan as an example. So, it's a programmable soft synthesizer for 4 kilobytes intros. It's distributed as two modules, a VST for a DAW, and assembly source that you compile into your intro. The VST plugin has an export button to write the track data into a file to be used in this compiled, uh, e compiled part, and the export Procedure is a bit obnoxious because we still don't have any visibility into a sequencer data, so you have to pull, play the full track in silence first to get the plugin to collect all the notes, and only then it has enough data to uh, do the export properly. Then this exported track data. Um, is taken by your build system and compiled into your intro and it usually takes about one kilobyte of space and the synthesizer core itself takes uh, another kilobyte and usually with, th with four kilobyte budget you're left with just two kilobytes for system code and visuals after you have your music. And this is a common uh, split for music and visuals. Some intros might have different splits, so intros might be more focused on music and have bigger music and smaller visuals and vice versa. So this split is not a guaranteed. You can do whatever you want, essentially. And this is a typical 4Clan uh, VST plugin window. You can see that it's fairly technical. And there is definitely some learning curve before you can actually use it productively. Uh, but people do that. It's completely possible. And underneath, it's conceptually, I think it's a, just a stack machine with some semblance of module crosstalk. Uh, so nothing that out of ordinary. So let's uh, listen for a few for clan music examples. And let's listen for to another example. You can hear that it's definitely way better and richer than just handcrafting a soft things by hand, but it does still sound a bit limited. So let's hear what's possible in a 64 kilobyte space. Okay, these did sound very professional and basically indistinguishable from the big music. As 64 bytes, uh, 64 kilobytes is a mind-bogglingly vast amount of space where anything is possible. 64 kilobytes ought to be enough for anybody. And on this big note is where I could end the talk, but let me backtrack a bit and show you the last one thing. A 256 bytes intro for a computer released back in 1982. 
256 bytes is shorter than this paragraph that I'm reading from my notes now. Enjoy. Isn't it cool? And now it is indeed the end. I hope you enjoyed this little adventure. Thanks go to all the amazing people who did all of the things I showed you and everyone who developed techniques and made it possible. And thank you for watching and listening.